Earlier in the show, I told you about a militant action in which a branch of the RBC went kaboom. Predictably, any time brave peeps try to take shit to the next level, so-called radicals bring out the same old tired arguments. The blowback from this action will make it harder to organize. This action takes the movement back 20 years. These people are irresponsible. Blah, blah, motherfucking blah. Seriously, these folks act like prisoners in a penitentiary who suck up to the guards to get special privileges while snitching on those trying to start the slave revolt. If they had it their way, these motherfuckers would have us organizing marches and dying till the end of the fucking world. According to my source, the end of the world will be on February 14th in the year 2016. Valentine's Day. Bummer. To help us unravel why this annoyance keeps happening, and since we have less than four years to go until the whole fucking thing goes to shit, I bring you Peter Gelderloos, author of How Nonviolence Protects the State. Hey Pete, how the fuck are you? Um, doing pretty good today. So, Peter. How the fuck does nonviolence protect the state? Basically the idea is that, well, especially in North America, uh, pacifists and nonviolent advocates have had a very defining role uh, and even a censoring role in determining what other people's participation can be in a whole range of social struggles. And, and that the, the way that they've affected social struggles has, been, has made it very much easier for the state to control those social struggles. That nonviolence plays a function of, of, of recuperating social struggles, of, of taking out their teeth, uh, making them harmless, so that they can just uh, exist in this, in this sort of um, cesspool of democratic plurality in which, uh, in which everything is okay, nothing can really be challenged or changed, uh, and, and ideas, opinions can be expressed uh, infinitely uh, without ever having any real impact, without really translating into action. Um, a lot of times people will, will justify nonviolence, making the very common sense, very simple uh, and, and, and ultimately false argument that um, you know, violence is the government's strong suit and it makes no sense to, uh, to fight the violence of the government with, with violence of our own. And what they're doing is conflating very, very different activities. They're suggesting that somehow um, defending yourself against police violence or, or destroying commodities or, or taking over property, fighting to free prisoners, indigenous people fighting to take over stolen land, uh, things of this nature, somehow has, has any similarities with governments carpet bombing uh, villages or, or using landmines or police torturing people or putting someone in prison. That, that just because by, by some linguistic coincidence uh, these different things can be described as violence, that somehow there's, there's not only similarities between them but that they're the same thing and that one is going to reproduce the other. When in fact, by fighting back, people actually uh, raise the stakes of repression and oppression for the state and, and actually make real short-term differences and I think also have, have a greater uh, potentiality of, of ultimately destroying the state in capitalism and, and helping us create those worlds that we want. Why is militant resistance celebrated throughout history? Like for instance, the American Revolution. But when it happens in the present tense, it's discouraged. I think it's because the left, uh, to a large extent, uh, subconsciously, has as its primary role to make resistance harmless. Um, states have, have recognized that, that resistance will never disappear, that struggles will never disappear. And in the past, they tried suppressing struggles the first time that they, uh, that, they, that they showed their heads, that there's any sign of them, and that proved ineffective. So nowadays, the way that states rule is by accepting the inevitability of, of conflict and resistance and just trying to manage it permanently. And the best way to manage it is to also have people in the resistance uh, who, are, who are managing it for you. And that's really the role that, that nonviolence plays and it's, it's really encouraged um, by the media, by, by various uh, dominant political discourses, that the state is allowed to use violence, but uh, people who are, who are rebelling, people who are angry, people who are trying to, um, to attack the system, are, are, are aggressively isolated, uh, slandered, uh, bad-mouthed, punished, if they ever uh, use violent tactics. From the burned-out shell of an Ottawa bank in a quiet family neighborhood come loud cries of condemnation against the self-proclaimed anarchists who blew it up. 
If blowing up this bank is advance notice or a way to boost the ranks of a murky anti-globalization movement, it may have backfired. There's been a wave of, of uh, criticism coming to, from even other special, uh, special interest groups. On the same website, other activists call the fire bombers everything from idiots to domestic terrorists who've crossed the line. Too radical. The mass of protesters in Canada don't support violent activity to start with, but there will be a minority that sees this as an inspirational message in order to carry out further violent acts. And so in this way, the state and the media train especially more professionally minded activists within the resistance to enforce this code of nonviolence so that they never incur that, that loss in popularity or, or, or that, that bad press. Um, and this creates a self-policing function that, and, and people who are the sort of politicians of the movement are more susceptible to it because they're thinking often in terms of their own careers. Give me some examples of how militant actions have helped the motherfucking resistance. The revolutionary anti-racist action in the Netherlands. So we're talking about uh, a very bourgeois and democratic society, a wealthy society, um, and, and also this was... Um, this was a group that was active uh, in, in the 80s, so uh, uh, relatively recently, the 80s and the beginning of the 90s. <clears throat> and they uh, participated in a broader movement uh, against Shell Oil Company, uh, specifically uh, f uh, demanding divestment from South Africa. Um, so this is part of, of larger anti-capitalist struggles and anti-racist struggles that, that had uh, along their path uh, certain goals that they wanted to achieve. Um, certain things that they were fighting for more immediately. And, and so this, um, this group, Revolutionary Anti-Racist Action, actually carried out a number of bombings and sabotage campaigns uh, against Shell and were successful in winning uh, uh, that divestment, in, in forcing Shell to, to, to pull out of South Africa by, by causing them uh, such, such immense amounts of damage, also in the context of, of many other tactics, including uh, uh, informational uh, campaigns and, and um, boycotts and protests and all these other things, working together had a very, had a very strong effect. Anytime someone brings up the idea of doing some gangster shit, these punk asses bring up Gandhi. What the fuck? Advocates of nonviolence, they, they frequently say that nonviolence works, and the principal examples that they use of that are Gandhi in India and Martin Luther King in, uh, in, in, in the US. Um, the problem with that is that, that this represents a, a great, this constitutes a really great historical whitewashing that, uh, in fact, the resistance in India was incredibly diverse, and Gandhi was a very important figure within that resistance, but the resistance was by no means pacifist in its entirety. That there were a number of, of armed guerrilla groups, a number of militant struggles, very um, important riots and, and, and other, other strong clashes, which were a part of the struggle for Indian independence. So on the one hand, Gandhi basically got negotiating power from the fact that there were that there were other um, other elements in the struggle which were even more threatening to British dominance, so the British specifically chose to to dialogue with Gandhi because he was perhaps for them the least threatening of the important elements of resistance, and and if those other elements had resisted had, had not existed, if those other elements had not existed, they simply could have ignored Gandhi. Thanks, Peter. And that about does it for this edition of It's the End of the World as we know it and I feel fine. A triple cheese whoop whoop with bacon to the following slaves for keeping this pulpit of vulgarity operational. Gordon, Audrey, Britton, Maureen, Joao, Michael, Stephen, Vincent, Sakura, Edwin, Jim, Peter, Michael, Rodney, Matthew, Dan, Bella, Carlos, Anastasios, Ryan, and Ria. Homerific. I'd also like to let y'all know that I have uploaded a new piece of my upcoming film and sieve on ncif.com. For links to militant actions or to comment on this show, just visit my fucking website, stimulator.tv. Now go out there and smash pacifism. Remember kids, you can podcast high quality video of this show at something media.tv.